Prologue. Plink, whoosh, plink, whoosh, whoosh, plink. Slow it down, Corporal, the gunnery sergeant shouted just loud enough to get the corporal's attention. The corporal despondently released his left index finger from the trigger and rested it on the trigger guard of his M4. In a momentary spat of frustration, the corporal spilled out a golf ball-sized wad of chewing tobacco. <laughs> if you shot like you spat, you'd be one hell of a marksman, son, the gunnery sergeant said half-jokingly. The corporal let out a displeasingly loud sigh and slowly tilted his head towards the gunnery sergeant. The glare from the sunset beamed off the gunnery sergeant's limited edition polarized teardrop-shaped aviator sunglasses. The advice was as simple as it was frustrating, like telling an irate soon-to-be ex-girlfriend to calm down during a ruckus shouting match. The corporal was hoping for something a little more insightful than slow it down. That's easy for you to say, the corporal replied with bated breath and a splash of sarcasm. The gunnery sergeant was unfazed and stood resolute over the corporal. His arms were crossed and hands remained firmly implanted in between his armpits. The corporal ran his fingers through his wavy blonde hair and clenched the back onto the foregrip of his M4 carbine. He squeezed the foregrip until his left hand started to turn white. The back side of his hand shined like a recently bleached toilet bowl. Sergeant DeStefano couldn't help but smile and reiterate his advice to the young corporal. Siler Salinas Mortalis, Sergeant Tony DeStefano said in a gingerly tone. Is that Latin for slow the fuck down? Corporal Janowski inquired with genuine curiosity. Swift, silent, and deadly. Commit it to memory. This isn't GCE. This is recon. Every bullet counts. Reset and re-engage the target, DeStefano suggested in a stern voice. The corporal took a deep breath, shook off his nerves, and readjusted the front sights of his M4. The shooting range was littered with spent shell casings. The range had human-shaped steel targets, ranging from 100 yards all the way out to 1,000 yards. The backstop of the firing range was a 30-foot-tall mound of dirt and an amalgamation of previously owned military Humvees. Firing range etiquette dictated that anything closer than 250 yards was sequestered for small arms and iron sights only. That put the nearest steel target about 250 yards downrange from the two men. The corporal slammed in a new magazine, cocked his rifle, pulled back the charging handle. The corporal was cocked, locked, and ready to roll. The feeling of slamming a new magazine into his rifle provided the corporal with a renewed sense of tranquility. De Stefano took a knee behind the corporal and tapped him twice on the right shoulder. It was an affirming pat like a father reassuring his son after losing his first little league game. Don't just pull the trigger. Squeeze the trigger. Think of your M4 like an extension of you. De Stefano instructed in a soft tone of voice. The corporal nodded his head and stared down range, eagerly sighting in his target. The rifle was wafting up and down as he attempted to sight in the target. Just as he was about to stabilize the rifle, it began to drift left. He placed his index finger on the trigger guard in a nervous attempt to steady his rifle. He took a series of deep controlled breaths and went to work. The corporal rained lead down on the target. More often than not, Corporal Janowski hit his mark, but that still wasn't good enough for the sergeant. Plink, whoosh, plink, whoosh, plink, whoosh, plink, whoosh. Well, that's one way to take out a target, De Stefano said while nodding his head up and down. It was the wind. I just need to compensate for the wind speed. The wind? Kid, this is Camp Lejeune. This ain't San Diego. Luckily for the corporal, the shooting range was characteristically emptied out this late in the day. Typically, De Stefano had free reign of the shooting range. Everyone except the range master, that is. He found a sense of peace in the solitude of shooting alone. I think I found your problem, De Stefano said. Yeah? How about you enlighten me? 
the corporal said sarcastically. What's her name? Who? Who? You're a rifle genius. That's who. What's her name? What? The corporal answered in utter befuddlement. Ah, uh, yeah. That's the problem. She doesn't have a proper name. You gotta give her a name, the gunnery sergeant said with a resounding tone of voice. You're kidding me, right? The corporal responded somewhat sarcastically. I don't joke about firearms, ever. Stefano waddled over to the back of the range and stood over a large black rifle case. He grabbed onto the case with his cartoonishly large hands and unsnapped the latches in rapid succession. Snap! 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 The gunnery sergeant's rifle case was about four feet in length and covered in stickers from countries around the world. The exterior of the case resembled that of a passport of sorts for the gunny. Some countries we publicly admitted to being in, and some that might be discovered one day through a Senate hearing or FOYA request. The sights are probably off. I just need to make an adjustment and tinker with the scope, the corporal explained. Tony scoffed at the corporal's logical and well-reasoned response. Move aside, Junior. Time for Betsy and I to put in some work. She ain't pretty, but hot damn she's reliable, Stefano said as he grabbed his Frankenstein M4 and moved into a prone shooting position. His solid gold cross and his Italian horn jingled as he got down into a shooting position. Stefano adjusted the sandbags on the ground and started brushing aside all of the spent shell casings. The brass jangled like a large gust hitting a set of wind Japanese chimes. Stefano stood about five feet five inches on a good day. He was stocky as hell and had thighs the size of beer kegs. In his spare time, he competed in triathlons and also in strongman competitions. To prove a point, he trained his M4 on the 500-yard target further downrange. He took a deep breath and fired a controlled three-round burst. Three loud gunshots rang out like a church bell caught in a tornado. Clack, clack, clack. Plink, plink, plink. The Stefano pulled back the charging handle and cleared his rifle. The firing range at Camp Lejeune was often serenaded with the sound of M4 carbines. It was like music to the gunnery sergeant's ears. No sound was quite as charming as an M4 carbine, chambered in a 5.56 by 45 millimeter NATO, air-cooled, gas-operated, direct impingement, magazine-fed, select-fire carbide. Aside from the brass shell casings falling to the ground, the range was silent. He detached the magazine and daintily placed it on the ground next to him. Smoke was still seeping out of the barrel, like the slow burn of a finely rolled Cuban cigar. Okay, kid, so what did I do that you did not? The Stefano asked while looking back over his shoulder at Janowski. The Stefano rolled over and hopped up into the squatting position. The glare from the sunlight hit his aviators and beamed a reflection back in Janowski's face. Um, you mean aside from not being an expert-level marksman since the age of ten? Janowski asked in a contemptuous tone of voice. Kid, I'm trying to teach you something here. Don't be such a fun ghoul. Stefano said in a boorish tone while towering over the Marine. Stefano glanced down at his cotton tactical cargo pants. To his displeasure, they were covered in dust and grime. He began feverishly dusting off his pants. A minuscule mist of dust matter began to hover around the gunnery sergeant. The gunnery sergeant discontinued the assault on his pants and took a second to size up the corporal. Corporal Kyle Janowski was the spitting image, nay, the textbook definition of a special officer. Kyle stood six foot five inches with a massive broad shoulders and a perfect V-shaped physique. He had an unkempt beard 20-inch biceps, and always wore designer sunglasses. His marksmanship was suspect, but he was reliable and as tough as they come. I honestly have no idea, Janowski replied with an inquisitive tone. Learn to shoot between your breaths. Take a breath, hold it for half a second, shoot and then exhale. It's as simple as that, Stefano explained. Got it. In between breaths, Janowski replied. Stefano removed his ear protection and motioned to Janowski to do the same. 
Janowski reticently acquiesced by removing his ears and placing them around his neck. The gunnery sergeant tilted his head to the side and started stroking his beard like the statue of the thinking man lost in deep contemplation. You were a machine gunner in the Corps, right? DeStefano asked. Sir, yes, sir, six years on the medium, Janowski said with some spunk. Hmm, what kind of equipment did they have you on exactly? Nothing but the best. The M240 belt-fed gas-operated medium machine gun, Janowski said with a feeling of pride. The gunnery sergeant started nodding his head in agreement like Sherlock Holmes stumbling upon a clue. The gunny almost instinctively knew how to remedy this situation. The corporal wasn't a lost cause, at least not quite yet. The gunny was amused with the spry young corporal. His naive sense of wonderment reminded him a lot of how the gunny used to be when he was first enlisted. Yeah, that explains a lot. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to mix it up on you. Sometimes it's better to play chess, and others it's better to just flip the fucking board over, DeStefano said. DeStefano walked over to Janowski sized up his M4. Janowski took a lot of pride in maintaining his M4. He had all the latest tactical add-ons, but none of the wear and tear of a battle-tested rifle. De Stefano could practically see his reflection bounce off the shine of the barrel. Ah, there's the problem, De Stefano said as he snatched the corporal's rifle. What? What is it now? De Stefano snatched the optical scope, ripped it off to the mounting rail. Janowski only responded with a stern look on his face, but the gunny could tell he was triggered and teetering on losing his shit. Nah, perfect. I'll fix. Try it now, he said and shoved the rifle into Janowski's chest. Janowski carefully examined the rifle in a state of shock. He gingerly clasped the rifle and rotated it from one side to the other. The corporal wasn't one to cry over spilled milk, so he went back to work. He started getting back down into his normal prone firing position. All of a sudden, De Stefano tapped him on the shoulder. He immediately looked back at the sergeant with a look of pure confusion. One more thing. Seated. Try shooting from the seated position this time, the gunnery sergeant said in almost a comical tone of voice. Seated? You're kidding me, right? The corporal responded in a different tone. I never joke about shooting. Break up your routine. Get on your ass and put some lead downrange, De Stefano replied back in a resolute demeanor. The corporal wasn't amused, nor adept at change. He was, however, an excellent soldier. He knew when to listen. He knew when to speak. He knew when to shut up. He plopped his butt down on the ground with his legs sprawled out in front of him. He looked downrange through his iron sights and focused solely on the target. He was noticeably struggling to sight in the target. The rifle was wafting in the wind. The corporal took several long, purposeful breaths and firmly gripped his rifle. Every passion breath helped the corporal focus in on his target. Like a zoom finder on a camera, he was tracking and timing his breathing, just like the sergeant ordered. He gently squeezed the trigger, followed by a loud, plink, bullseye. The corporal whispered. There was an aroma of smugness that emboldened the corporal. The corporal snuck a quick smile and cleared his rifle. Smoke slowly protruded from the end of the barrel like the last gasp of a cigarette. Well, that's it for today. Quit while you're ahead. That's my motto. Let's shower up and get the hell off base, DeStefano said in a self-congratulatory manner. Thank God. Oh, man. There's nothing sweeter in this world than a three-day reprieve, Janowski cheered and slapped his knee. The men hopped up and started packing up their weapons. The taxing nature of being a special operator weighed heavily on the Stefano. Janowski picked up the gunnery sergeant's mood and said, Come on, Gramps. You're making me look bad. Let's pick up the pace. The Stefano snapped out of his trance, scoffed, and shook his head. The near two decades of service paid a substantial toll on the gunnery sergeant. He started packing up his gear in a slightly more intentional and expedient manner. He overemphasized every motion and ironically stared at Janowski, like someone staring you down at a red light ready to race. Both men 
double timed it back to the barracks. Meanwhile, at one of the base's many indoor training facilities, Sergeant Allen found himself face down. He was pinned to the business end of a rubber floor mat. He rolled to his left and was met with resistance. He rolled to his right and was met with even more resistance. The mat was almost completely tattered and encrusted in a faded royal blue color. All except those worn white spider web ripples that protruded throughout the mat. Over time, the cushioning had really evaporated, and the slightest amount of pressure would produce a large crackling sound. Sergeant Hernandez started laughing in between exerted breaths and asked, <laughs> That's all you got? I'm working on it, Alan said, struggling to gain his composure on the mat. He wasn't aching for a losing and didn't make a habit of giving up. In Alan's mind, it was better to lose than to give up. Work smarter, not harder, Hernandez murmured while rolling around. Sergeant Allen attempted to spin out, only for Hernandez to take his back and slip into a rear neck chokehold. Come on, tap, tap, sir, Hernandez said while tightening his grip. Sergeant Allen struggled in a feeble attempt to escape the chokehold. Hernandez didn't let off the choke. He was trying to make a point. As the chokehold tightened, Mike's resistance faded away. Come on, sir. Tap. Why you gotta be so fucking stubborn all the time? Sergeant Allen attempted to dispute the reality of his situation and utter some kind of retort. The only audible sound he could produce was a gargled set of half utterances that loosely resembled words. The sound was reminiscent of something you would hear on the Nature Channel, like a gazelle being devoured by a bow constrictor. The world around him started to dissipate. The light became fleeting and his lens dampened. Just like that, it was nap time for Mike Allen. Sir? Hernandez said with a concerned tone. To the dismay of Hernandez, the sergeant's body was completely limp. Hernandez rolled Mike Allen over and started gently patting him on the face. Hernandez started laughing aloud to an empty room. Allen opened his eyes and began to stare at the ceiling tiles. He was clearly dazed and confused. Hernandez couldn't refrain from laughing as the sergeant was trying to recollect what happened. What's so funny? Mike Allen said after barely regaining consciousness. You gotta be the most stubborn son of a bitch on this base, sir. Mike Allen laughed off his comment in an attempt to maintain his what was left of his shattered ego. Opinions vary, Hernandez. I almost had you. The mat was drenched in sweat from hours of Brazilian jiu-jitsu practice. Mike rolled back and sat cross-legged on the mat. Hernandez started instinctively stretching his legs out. Both men took a second regain over their composure and shoot to shit. Any plans for your leave? Plans? Yeah, outside of running covert warfare, I assumed you had some kind of a life. The missus wants me to mow the yard, if you know what I mean. I just hope to get some time in front of the TV, light beer, football, and family. Nothing mellows me out more than a case of ice-cold domestic piss water. Light beer. Truly the sign of a distinguished gentleman. A man of refined and exquisite taste, he said with zeal. Not everyone used to be a corporate bigwig like you, Sergeant. Fair enough. Why do you ask? What you got going on? Hernandez figured Sergeant Allen was fishing for a conversation, so why not give it to him? I'm working on becoming an insurance actuary. Jesus Christ, why? Why? Why what? Why in the fuck would you want to do that? You mean instead of sitting on my ass and drinking light beer and watching football? Yeah, what's wrong with you, sir? It's one of the oldest professions in the world. What is? Prostitution for 500, Alex? No, Nimrod. Insurance actuaries are among the oldest professions in the world. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I'll bite. What is an insurance actuary? Um, basically, actuaries are like odd makers. But instead of working for a crooked casino, they work for crooked insurance companies. Odds making, huh? That about sums it up. Well, what do you give Detroit this weekend against New England? Is Detroit playing a home or away? I think they're... Mike Allen interrupted Hernandez and said, It doesn't matter. That was a trick question. 
New England wins by at least nine points. I'd bet the farm on New England for a blowout win. Luckily for Mike Allen, the close quarters combat training facility was only 100 meters from the barracks, which made for a nice brisk stroll home. On the way back to the barracks, Mike noticed a small motorcade of black SUVs conspicuously parked over by the briefing room. It worried him, but not enough to inquire any further. As far as he was concerned, his next mission was to take a shower and get the hell off base. Janowski swung open the door to the barracks in eager anticipation to get packed up and off base. When he opened the door, the entire squad was inside unpacking gear bags. Janowski stood in the doorway with a confused expression, painted across his enlarged crow magnum brow. He started stroking his left earlobe, clearly deep lost in thought. The rest of the squad looked up for a second and Corporal Janowski, and then immediately went back to unpacking. What's so funny? Janowski asked hesitantly. He slowly stepped into the barracks and started scanning the room. One thing the corporal didn't take kindly to was being the butt of a joke. What's so funny? You mean, besides your aim, right? Hernandez Ed shouted from the back of the room. Destefano walked into the barracks with his rifle bag slumped over his shoulder. He looked around the squad and took off his sunglasses. He immediately read the situation and started laughing. Tony had a bellowing physicality to his laugh. He really put his whole body into it. Tony found his way back to his bunk to unpack with the rest of the men. What did I miss? Janowski pulled the room. What, aside from the broadside of a barn? Hernandez chimed in again. Hernandez was the runt of the litter in the unit, which probably accounted for his sense of humor. He never missed an opportunity to get a job, snide remark, or a dig. Just start unpacking, new guy, Whitaker explained while I was neatly unpacking his sea bags. Whitaker was one of the most organized operators in the unit. He had a knack for being methodical in every aspect of his life. Janowski looked over to Hernandez, somewhat uncertain of where to draw the line, so he poked the beehive a little. Hernandez, I heard stories about you, he said. Hernandez looked up with an amused gaze at the young corporal. Hernandez was the one normally busting balls on base and not very used to the role reversal. Yeah, why have you heard? He asked while staring daggers right into the young corporal's eyes. I heard that you really put the special in special operator, he replied. The smirk was immediately wiped off his face and his demeanor soared like a rotting banana. Hernandez was used to dishing it out not a fan of being on the receiving end of comic relief. The squad all looked up for a second at the young corporal and simultaneously burst into laughter. He sprung up ready to throw down with young corporal. Luckily for the young corporal, Whitaker popped up and politely subdued Hernandez. Whitaker threw himself in between the two squabbling teammates. Luckily for Whitaker, he was one scrappy SOB and none of the men dare cross him. Hernandez and Whitaker locked eyes to kick off the proverbial pissing contest of the evening. Whitaker was towering over Hernandez, attempting to subdue the pre-mission jitters. Hernandez grabbed the end of his mustache and wiped it with his thumb. Whitaker took both of his hands, patted him on the shoulders. You good, amigo? Hernandez smiled and nodded at the sergeant, like a cowboy tipping his hat. It wasn't the first time some new guy tried to pull some macho bullshit. Whitaker felt that with that kind of attitude, the corporal would fit right in with the rest of the men. I'm good, buddy. I'm good. These fucking new guys, man. Whitaker had 14 distinctive, equidistant, thick black lines tattooed on the inside of his left forearm. One for each of the EOD technicians who perished in Iraq and Afghanistan. Since 2005, he made a point to keep his sleeve perpetually rolled up as a sobering reminder of the courage and sacrifice it takes to be an EOD technician. Whitaker spent his first two tours of duty cutting his teeth in the Explosive Ordnance Disposal, EOD, unit during the height of Operation Al-Fajar. Whitaker often found himself playing dad within the camp. Every family has issues, and for the Marine Recon Regiment at Camp Lejeune, that's exactly what it was, a family.
Nice to meet you, by the way. I'm Whitaker. Call sign, Tortuga. Whitaker replied and stuck out his hand to Janowski. Janowski eagerly obliged. He wanted to make a good impression with the rest of the squad. He sure did have a funny way of showing it. What's the deal? They're shipping us out. Where to? Janowski briefly protested to the group. The men picked up on his nervousness. It was only customary for the new guy to have a bit of unease going into the first mission briefing. Preach, what do you make of all this? Hernandez asked his devout teammate. Hernandez weakly protested the situation by shoving his bags under his bunk, like a teenager begrudgingly doing laundry for the first time. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. It's Matthew. Preach appended in a stoic tone as he read passages from his handy pocket Bible. It was an old pocket Bible that Lindell kept tucked away in his boot. Good shit, Preach. Good shit, Hernandez said. Real fucking ominous as always, Barnes said under his breath. The years of attending to dying comrades hardened Barnes in a way that made him rather cynical about war. The way he figured it, he could be part of the problem or part of the solution. He found solace in serving as a medical corpsman. Barnes wiped the melancholic look from his brow and made his way over to the briefing room without so much as an introduction to the new guy. Without notice, Preach sprang up and stuck his hand out to introduce himself to Janowski. Preach stood six foot seven inches tall and weighed in at a lean 225 pounds. He was a slender mountain of a man with a soft smoking yet rusty tone of voice. Corporal Lyndall Jones, they call me Preach. Nice to meet you, kid, the corporal said in a deepened tone of voice. Lyndall was covered shoulders to feet in tattoos. He spent his formative years on the streets of South Central. Lyndall had the leathered street skin, the kind of thick skin acquired from hundreds of street fights and unfortunate run-ins with the wrong side of the law. After too many near-death encounters, he chose a higher path, the righteous path. Lyndall devoted his life to God and to the Corps. Janowski quickly shook hands with the corporal and went back to aimlessly wandering the barracks. You can gripe till the cows come home, kid. That ain't going to change the fact that our reprieve is DOA. One piece of advice, just don't be late for the briefing, kid. Corporal Barnes squawked. Barnes was sifting through his footlocker searching for something. Barnes had one of the most unkempt bunks, but nonetheless the men entrusted their lives with him. Janowski accepted the advice with a nod and a wink. Janowski pulled to Stefano aside for a brief consultation. What's the deal with Barnes? He whispered as silently as a librarian. The deal? Don't mind Barnes. His bedside manner is a lot like his foreplay, and that it's extremely brief and lacking of tenderness, De Stefano replied. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, don't take it personally. Why do you think his call sign is Zippo? He's quick and useful in a pinch. Janowski started navigating his way towards his bunk. He traversed carefully through the labyrinth of bunks and sea bags. He made sure not to disturb any of the luggage left behind by his fellow crewmen. As soon as he was able to manage putting his bag down, Mike Allen stepped into the foreground of the room with a commanding presence. Nice to meet you, kid. I'll see you at the brief, Lance Corporal Yamada said while patting him on the shoulder. Yamada was short and slender. He had slick, back, razor black hair with a tattoo on his neck of aces and eights. Yamada was one of the new transfers from the Raider Regiment. He was quiet and reclusive, but the men appreciated his resolve. Drop what you're doing. Let's double time to the mission brief, First Sergeant Allen shouted to the remainder of the squadron. One by one, they disembarked from the barracks and expeditiously headed over to the briefing room.